happened. So, as you remember well, what we are, you don't, to, just a quick reminder, what we're doing by giving immune checkpoint inhibitors is basically reactivating the T cell here in the middle and rearming the T cell against the cancer. Because the cancer is a pretty clever, would say, organism that is going to develop a diplomatic passport thing, which is PDL1. So it will escape T cell by this PDL1 being upregulated and finding PD1 on the T cell, leading to its uh, down regulation and toning down. So it will create an energy of the T cell. So you have to also have in mind that basically a cell, a cardiac cell, or whatever cell that is suffering is going to upregulate PDL1 to escape the destruction. It's basically telling PDL1 and PD1 system, it's just a way to say, please do not destroy me. I'm having some situation, I'm restoring myself, preparing myself, do not destroy me. So it's just a generic system, mechanism of escaping. So cancer cells have hijacked the system and understood it in a way that they have been able to upregulate PDL1. So by inhibiting PD1 and PDL1, you're restoring back the T cell possibility to destroy the cancer cell. Another point that you have to keep in mind is T cell. Basically, you, we all have a lot of autoreactive T cell against a bunch of stuff because when we when we when we are born, we're going to face a lot of different situation infections or different situations. So we do have in our own organism a large variety of T cells that are autoreactive and can be expanded when needed. So to not have a bunch of autoimmune diseases spontaneously those T cells are down-regulated upstream here by CTLA-4. So CTLA-4 is kind of the down-regulator of all the autoimmune T cell, autoreactive T cells that we do have in our organism. So a T cell, another way to reactivate T cells is basically by inhibiting CTLA-4 as well. And the last point that you have to keep in mind is those antigen-presenting cells, monocyte, for example, are here to track and identify all the cells and organ cells or tumor cells that need to be destroyed by the T cells. So antigen presenting cells are here like the, the boss to identify the antigen, present the antigen through TCR, T cell receptor to T cell, to, to identify who the T cell should kill. But in general, to be activated, you need a second signal. So here antigen is just which cell do I have to target? And the CD80, CD86, CD28 interaction here is like, okay, you have your target, you can now kill it. So it needs both signal, targeted identification and activation here. So in general, CTLA4 impede this interaction. So in, when you put anti-CTLA4, epithelium up, the second signal interaction is facilitated and T cells are much prone to autoreactivity and enhanced uh, aggressivity. So of course, when you combine CTLA4 inhibitors, PD-1 or pd one inhibitors, you boost even more your system. So overall, this is how it works. Reactivating the T cell to kill the cancer cell. So as you all know, ICI has been like a very huge success in medicine overall. It was awarded by Isambol Price in 2018, James Allison and Paco Suanjo, and the number of trials have exploded, as you can see here, with over 20 cancer indications. And as of today, over 50% of cancer patients, even in neoadjuvant setting now, are going to be eligible for ICI. So basically, a very, like most cancer patient, metastatic or not, are going to be having an indication for ICI. So we, I showed you CTLA-4, PD-1, PD-L1, but you have to understand that the immunological synapse and the interaction between APCs and T cell, it's much more complex than those two signals. There are many, many other possible signals for second activation, and a bunch of them are being investigated right now. One just got approved is anti lax 3 relatlimab, recently approved as an immune checkpoint inhibitor, a new class of immune checkpoint inhibitor recently approved. So we're going to face in the next decade, probably other different uh, types of immune checkpoint inhibitors. So what are the main cardiovascular toxicities we should think about in the follow-up of patients on ICI? 
So this was our first work, basically, uh, one of the first work with Javed. So as you remember, well, he, he described in 2016 in the New England Journal of Medicine, the two first cases with Doc Johnson. And so here uh, I arrived in his lab at Vanderbilt at that point as a postdoc. And we have done this study, uh, studying querying all the cardiovascular toxicities ranked here associated to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And the ones that are significant are in bold. So it's basically all the one with an IC025 here uh, over zero. And here is the N of patient observed. So 122 microditis, 100 pericarditis, vasculitis, here are the numbers. So basically it made sense. Any single cardiovascular condition with itis at the end, microditis, pericarditis, vasculitis was popping up. We were reactivating with the immune system and basically the immune system was able to recognize some of the uh, cardiovascular organs and induce their inflammation. So microditis, pericarditis, vasculitis. To better understand if there were some kind of risk factors for this different uh, cardiovascular condition as a function of the drug received, we analyzed subgroup, subgroups of PD-1 and CTLA-4 monotherapies and combination of this therapies versus monotherapies. As, as you can see here, odds ratio was five times higher on anti-PD-1 versus anti-CTLA-4, and combination of PD-1 and CTLA-4 inhibitors were, was associated with four times more, again, against monotherapy. So myocarditis, it's more of anti-PD-1, PD-L1 disease, but also enhanced and boosted by combination therapy. Uh, temporal arthritis is the other way around. It's basically four or five times higher on anti-CTLA-4 than anti-PD-1 monotherapies. So these diseases, do they overlap? In this first work, we showed that no, there were no major overlapping diseases. And basically it makes sense. Well, as I discussed, T cells are reactivated and they'll rec recognize different antigens. And the antigen um, exposed by myocardium, pericardium, and vascular tissues is not the same. They're not coming from the same embryo embryological um, uh, place. And the, the myosin, for example, is expressed in, in the myocardium, but it's not expressed in the pericardium and vascular. When does it occur? In this first patient, it was shown that it occurred very, very promptly in the first few months after few doses. So basically ICI are giving every two to three weeks. And here we were able to see that over 90, 80, 90% occurred within the first three months. Well, again, it makes sense when you know the pharmacology of these drugs. When you put on ICI, it needs two, three weeks, four weeks, to activate the system. So as soon as you activate the system to have your anti-cancer effects that you observe generally a month after starting it, of course, at this point, you can also activate the wrong cells and observe your side effects. So what about the incidence? So in this first work, in collaboration with the BMS, uh, BMS registry, basically Javid was a, and his group shown here that the incidence in Cancer trial where oncologists were not aware and not seeking for diseases, these diseases, that incidence was very, very low, 0.06% on monotherapy of NTPD1, and increased again uh, on combination of uh, NTCTLA4 and NTPD1, 0.3%. And in this first cohort at MGH, they showed that the incidence was around 1%. But here in this uh, MGH uh, cohort, we have to keep in mind that people were seeking for it very, very sorely, and basically were calling every single troponin increase as a microditis. So eventually, potentially an overestimation here of the real incidence, because again, not every single troponin increase is a microditis. In our own experience, basically half of the time it is not. And we're having the bias selection toward microditis. So in this recent meta-analysis of all the clinical trials published uh, until 2020, the incidence was again confirmed or shown around 0.3%. And you can see here the reporting uh, the PETO odds ratio 
So a nine around nine time increase of myocarditis in the ICI arm versus controls, controls in those RCTs. So here you have this very high uh, odds ratio all, also confirmed and 0 0.3 incidence. The other cardiovascular condition, basically they queried exactly the same, the same terms that we queried in our first paper on Stoncology 2018. They showed that other cardiovascular condition, those ones may be a bit overreported, but as you can see, it's below two and the confidence interval is very, very, very close to one. So it's some signal emerging, but it's not clear yet if it's really the case, except for dyslipidemia. To be honest, I just don't know what to do with this one, but it was popping up. So if we go back to Ms. M, this patient came with basically diplopia, subacute painful pyresis, and she was in ophthalmology before coming in cardiology. She was there because 10 days after the third dose of neolumab, she developed this ophthalmological symptoms. And three days after being in ophthalmology, she developed acute chest pain with the ECG you're seeing here, which was expected to be eventually an acute coronary syndrome, ST+. Plus. But as you can already observe, and we'll see it afterwards, ECG is super key in this disease. You can observe that there is a right bundle branch block and the voltage here are super low. So basically the micro voltage that you observe here with those conduction delays that are very increased and very spread out are kind of specific of the disease. So we went on, it was our first patient, uh, coronary angiogram, normal, troponin T increase very high. Basically, the upper reference limit is 14 and not 50. It's 14 in our, in our center. Anti-pro anti BNP is up. LVF is normal. Cardiac MRI is showing this late gadolinium enhancement here, mid-myocardial, apical. So based on this first criteria that we tried to, to put together, the diagnosis of myocarditis is definite based on CMR syndrome, biomarker, ECG, wall motion abnormality, negative angiography. So we have to remember that those criteria were established basically by a group of experts, but we had very few experience at this time point, maybe a 50, 60 case. So of course they need to be refined, but it was helpful to start with. So diagnostic of myocarditis is not that easy at the end of the day, and we can discuss that further. So if we go here, what should we see or expect in, in myocarditis? In general, troponin is increased very, very, very often. It's super sensitive, you can see it here. ECG, at least in those first symptomatic forms, was also very often abnormal. EF on the other side is not very helpful, not to say completely useless. So echo is basically marginally helpful, at least uh, now in those cases that are emerging being asymptomatic. Anti-proBNP, I don't really know. And cardiac MRI, we have to be extremely, extremely, extremely careful because when we use late gadolinium enhancement, which is basically the, the tool that is readily available, it's negative normal in over 80% of cases when you do it promptly in the first four days of admission. In those first cases described here, that were the symptomatic cases. And now we're going toward screening, diagnosing earlier. So when you have a very subtle starting myocarditis, your cardiac MRI, at least if you go for LGE, is not going to be very helpful. But you have to keep in mind that repeating MRI, cardiac MRI, can be helpful because if you wait a bit, sometimes LG will pop up and become positive. So cardiac MRI is really to be nuanced in, in this disease. I'm not saying for myocarditis in general, for viral myocarditis is good, but here for this specific disease, uh, which is exactly not having the same pathophysiology, neither the same clinical feature, it's not, it can be misleading. So if we look in the detail of cardiac MRI here, we can see the positivity rate in terms of presence of LGE as a function of day of admission in this international registry of over 100 cases. 
And you can see here that it is negative, as I showed you, most often when you perform it early. And it is not predictive of MACE in terms of LGE. The last feature that we have also to keep in mind when you record a camera guy is that the late gadolinium enhancement can be all over the place. It can be sub-epicardial, like in viral carditis, but it can also be patchy or even sub-endocardial, like typically uh, car cardiac ischemia or infarction. So the LGE can be all over the place, all localization. And I have a bunch of cases with sub-endocardial uh, LGE confirmed in cardiac pathology and with normal angiography. Another thing important to keep in mind, so this study is a bit, it's a small study. It's only 22 patients. It's 22 patients eligible to uh, ICI. But in this study, 30%, 30% had visible LGE before starting, before starting ICI. So basically, when you're just relying on LGE, many cases can just have LGE before even starting L uh, ICI. Another important point, when you go for studying the, the mapping, T1 and T2 mapping to go most, more thoroughly, in the details, you can observe that just by being on ICI. So those cases did not have any microdiets. It was just people eligible to ICI. They do have a significant change in T1 and in T2 mapping just by the fact that they are on ICI. So basically, the study suggests that ICI by itself will change the immunology of the heart in general and eventually change the extracellular volume, will change basically the cardiac muscle and cardiac tissue properties. So you cannot just use, uh, without doing specific studies, uh, standard cardiac MRI, T1 and T2 standard um, value. So probably it can be helpful cardiac MRI, but it really needs to, we do need very specific studies um, focused on people put on ICI. So PET-FDG. So PET-FDG, this one is from our center. Uh, it was a few years ago. Um, when we had uh, 60 patients at this point, 30 were confirmed, 30 were infirmed. And basically, when you go for PET-FDG in patient without or with cardiac um, microditis, most often it's negative, as you can see here, and only 10%, even in confirmed cases by biopsy, is positive. So it's not sensitive at all. Just... 2 over 24, and it's not, the positivity rate is not discriminating, in discriminating cases from control. So very poor sensitivity and no discrimination versus control. I do not think that 18 FDG has a real major role here. The main drawback that we can say in the study, it was our first cases. So they were pretty severe and putting them in the PET-FDG was a challenge. So sometimes it took some time to put them. So you can see the dots here. And it may have been delayed, the, the PET-FDG exam. So maybe one can say that delaying the PET-FDG eventually had made our study negative. But in real life practice, at least in the first cases that were very severe and symptomatic, uh, it would not have been very helpful. Plus, you can see that all those dots are done when the troponin T level are still very, very high, over 10 normal limits. So it was an active disease um, based on biomarker, at least. In terms of clinics, so we go back to this first study where for a while it was the biggest in terms of, uh, of N. Now with Javid, we were able to put a very important international effort and we will soon have result on over 800 cases, but it's not very different actually from those results we initially showed. So um, time to onset, 30 days, few doses, one, two, three. So it generally occurs very fast and promptly. Either you have it or you don't have it, this autoreactive T cell basically. The death rate in those first cases was 50%. And it was very, very often 
associated to muscular disorder myositis and myasthenia gravis-like syndromes and hepatitis. So this you have to keep in mind and imagine that people that reported those cases were basically pharmacologists and cardiologists, not really at all seeking and knowing anything about myasthenia or myositis or hepatitis. So when those people are already reporting at such high rate, basically me kind of shocked me. I was, if there is 30% already reported here, it's maybe 100%. It's just that when you ask a cardiologist to do and seek for myositis, it's not an easy task. And then in terms of mortality, the main seriousness criteria were half of the time arrhythmia, life-threatening arrhythmia, and the other half uh, cardiac shock. So my site is my tenia gravis-like syndrome. So basically, I can just tell you that it is not my tenia gravis. Now we have several paper upcoming on this issue, not yet completely published all, but it's... Uh, when you go for electromyogram, it's always myogenic syndromes without hint of neuromuscular dysfunction. There are very, very, very rare cases where the patient prior to starting ICI have myasthenia gravis that can be a risk factor for developing myogenitis, but it is not the pathophysiology when the patient come, then and have myasthenia gravis-like syndromes, you go for biopsy, CK are up, uh, muscular biopsy is positive, electromyograms show, show myogenic syndrome, so muscle destroyed, and no features of neuromuscular dysfunction. In terms of acetylcholine receptor antibody, it can be positive in up to 20% of patients. But again, it's another story. When you check for it, it was already positive prior to starting ICI myocarditis. Uh, ICI. So in terms of of, uh, I would say, myositis. When you have a myositis alone, when we queried VGBase again, myositis alone mortality was around 20%. When you have myositis plus myasthenia gravis-like syndrome, it's 25%. And when you have both, it's 50% mortality. So even when you looked at the myositis scope in this paper, uh, in this paper that, again, is, is now a bit old in terms of like patient queried, there was also an association, uh, frequent association in myositis cases of myasthenia gravis like and myocarditis. And those cases having the triplet, myositis, myasthenia gravis, and myocarditis, they were really, really high risk of death. In terms of pathophysiology, oops. In terms of pathophysiology, on the left here, you have a normal cardiac biopsy, it's like a stack. And uh, in this first paper by Javed and Dog, we they have identified something key, which is like those T cell, those blue dots, CD3 and CD8, infiltrating the different muscles and destroying them on the heart here, and also as well in the first cases reported in the skeletal and smooth muscle. So you have an infiltration of the T cell and macrophages, killing the myocardium. Now, a few weeks ago. They published the antigen, this, the target, the TCR, what it is, the TCR of the T cell, what antigen is it recognizing? And it's a, a recognizing eventually alpha myosin that is present in all the muscle. So when you go back to the pathophysiology, you have your autoreactive T cell in you, basically targeting alpha myosin or other shared antigen between the different muscles. Maybe it's not just alpha myosin, and alpha myosin is one of them, but those autoreactive T cell recognizing the muscle of which the heart is one, boom, being boosted by ICI, and then killing basically all the muscle at the same time. So the phenotypic expressions, the clinical expression can be a bit different. Some will have more heart issues, other will have more peripheral muscle issues, but at the end of the day, it's the same disease. So me, I'm not calling it anymore myocarditis. I'm calling it myotoxicity. Because some people may have a myocarditis later on. It can be a viral myocarditis, even in patient in ICI treated. But it's not a myotoxicity that can be a challenge when you're going to think about re-challenging the patient. And in terms of pathophysiology, in this study from Boston as well, they compared ICI microdice to acute cellular rejection, which basically was the most 
the closest disease we had in mind at that point. And basically, I always remember when Javid told me he sent out the first samples of cardiac muscle to his colleague in pathology, and he asked him, what do you think this disease is? It was basically the first description of this disease. The pathologist answered, it's easy. It's acute cellular rejection when the patient was transplanted. And the guy, of course, was not transplanted. So the closest disease we had at this point was acute cellular rejection. They compared it to acute cellular rejection, high-grade and low-grade myocarditis. There are already some differences in terms of macrophagic to, to lymphocytic infiltration. So there is a very huge increase CD68 on CD3 ratio, so much more macrophages than uh, there is um, uh, lymphocytes. And in terms of PDL1 expression, again, it's much more increased in this disease as compared to acute cellular rejection. So in this women, the first one we described, we were already uh, a bit uh, has any okay, okay, not just seeing something. So the, in the muscle biopsy, we have performed muscle biopsy in this patient, and we observed the exact same thing that we were expecting, which is T cells, CD3, CD4, CD8, and macrophages, CD68, all those brown dots, with multiple focal necrosis of the muscle. So how about treatment? So the guidelines basically have changed a lot in the last five years, but it was basically based on what we know or what oncologists know about other immune-related adverse events in other diseases and on very few case reports. So the reliability of these guidelines are very low, but I'm going to show them quickly. In this guidelines, they say that all grades Low grades, grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. So low grade, it's no symptoms. Grade two, it's some biomarkers, some symptoms. Grade three, it's symptoms. And grade four, it's severe. Grade five, you're dead. So all grades weren't work up. And when you hold ICI in all grades, and you try to investigate if this troponin increase, you recheck six hours later and you see if it's going up, if you think it's really related to ICI or not. If you think it's related to ICI, it's kind of, uh, you don't, uh, you do, you stop ICI and that's it. If it's a grade two, you stop ICI and you never restart it and you start corticosteroids, one to two milligram per kilo. And if it's not enough, you go up in terms of dose. And if it's not enough, you can add all these different uh, immunomodulator listed on the right. In terms of immune-related adverse event, when we compare what is microditis in, in comparison to the other um, immune-related adverse event, you can see that microditis is less, it's, it's very rare as compared to colitis, pneumonitis, hepatitis, but it is the most fatal, 40%. And in terms of timing to treatment, we, this study on the right is a retrospective registry uh, Clearly, my own experience here is probably over what is here, and I cannot say I can confirm this, but maybe I'm going to show it at least. It's that high-dose steroids introduced within 24 hours of uh, treatment will save everybody with no mace. And if you're a bit late in terms of treatment and give lower dose of steroids, everybody will die, basically, if you simplify this figure. Unfortunately, uh, it's not exactly what I'm seeing because I'm having a lot of those 23 patients being diagnosed promptly and having a very, very, very high dose that are going to evolve to corticoresistant. And actually, in the red cap, in the 800 cases that we have recently started the analysis, we have over 60, 70% that is going to be corticoresistant. And in this updated analysis, time to treatment by steroids is not associated with MACE. But this is what is presented here, at least I'm showing it to you. So of course, based on all this, we started the REDCap International, collecting cases worldwide with a lot of collaborators. And now we're over 750, 800 cases, and we collected a lot of data points, ECG, clinical presentation, and different options. So this first work here, 
probably we're never going to be able to publish it, of course, because now it's too late. But in those 180, we already have observed that there were like 40% that were steroids uh, resistant. And when you had corticosteroid resistance, you were twice, uh, you had a twice higher mortality, 43% versus 23%. And interestingly, some patients here already did not receive steroids and not all died. 50% were living with no steroid treatment and no immunosuppressant. If you have, so this was a bit for me when I have seen those results the first time, I was a bit perplexed. So how people with zero steroids and having a diagnosis of myocarditis are still living? Is it that they don't have myocarditis and people have entered, I don't know what, or is it that basically not every single microdiet need to be treated? And, um, and so here, what is ICI myocarditis place in terms of drug-induced myocarditis as compared to the other myocarditis? Here you have a bunch of other drug-induced myocarditis squaring VGBase, International Pharmacovigilance Database. And you can see here in the green, the green line is basically the very steep increase in drug-induced myocarditis reported here. It's ICI myocarditis. So really a very steep increase of myocarditis induced by immune checkpoint inhibitor. And the main cause being the purple here, being clozapine induced antipsychotic. And in yellow, you have some kind of vaccine-induced myocarditis. Uh, we, we were lucky enough to do this study before COVID hit, because here I can tell you that now you have 400, 500 cases with uh, vaccine and COVID vaccine. We have over 50,000 now cases of myocarditis. So this scale would not fit at all. But here in this, in this study, you can see that it was uh, becoming one of the first causes of drug-induced myocarditis before COVID vaccination uh, strategy. And in terms of mortality, in, on those 500 plus cases, you can see that the first 130 cases died 42%, but mortality has not really decreased that magnificently over time, despite being treated very massively by, by corticosteroids and other second line treatment over time. So this was the first work of this uh, micro, microditis registry where we focused on ECG. And what we identified on ECG baseline prior to ICI start and then on ICI, we were able to identify that microditis patient had increased QRS lens and decreased voltage and also more Conduction disorders that you can see here. So QRS lens is here versus this one baseline. This one is cases. So call of voltage is voltage is decreased 129, 39, 169. More conduction disorders, more PVCs, more repolarization abnormality. So in those 150 cases of which we had 50 uh, compar comparable ECG with baseline. So those cases, again, were very symptomatic and severe. You have to understand that the first cases were basically the tip of the iceberg. So one is more, uh, more noisy. Those one are had really pathological ECGs. And again, if I show you this ECG to have in mind and to see how, how it looks like, this one is a baseline ECG before ICI. The patient is a thymoma patient receiving one dose, boom, developing a fulminant microditis 10 days later, and look at this ECG change. Voltage is massively decreased, QRS is highly prolonged, and Q wave uh, appeared as well. So here in inferior leads. So this is a change you can observe on ECG. The voltage go down, the QRS is widened, the repolarization is modified. So that's why I really think that having baseline ECG in patient put on ICI can really be helpful for us in terms of diagnosis. So, and I put you back in mind this first cases I showed you. Again, you can see the micro voltage, the bundle blood block. I don't have the baseline ECG for her uh, right now, but you can see like, super microvolted. So appearance of Q waves and low voltage are very at very high risk of developing maids. So those features, when you see them in the patient, you have a five to six time increase in mace, uh, all-cause mortality, sorry, even 
in those patients with microdiabetes. So appearance of Q-waves and low voltage, keep in mind and keep track of them. Occurrence of light threatening ventricular arrhythmia and third degree AV block are again very high and are surrogates with very high risk factors of mortality in those patients again. So when you monitor the patient, you have to, to be careful for those types of arrhythmias. And if we go back to uh, Ms. M, so this was again our first case when I was back uh, to France from Javits lab at Bendy and we were studying it for a year. So I had already had in my mind what I think may be helpful in terms of treatment, which is this, a bad accept. We had this patient coming in, we gave her right away within like 24 hours of admission, this very, very high dose of steroids and didn't work. Went up troponin level here around 7,000. We started plasma pheresis, thinking that maybe we will be able to get rid of nivolumab, which you see here. Yeah, we were, we were able to get rid of a substantial amount of nivolumab, but I can tell you now that it was really not enough because what we're giving to patient mm -hmm. is basically over 1,000 what is needed to completely block the system and the system will be blocked with one dose for three to six months. So even when we do plasma pheresis, you are not taking out the PD-1 stuck on the PD-1 T cell receptor. So didn't work. And she started arrhythmias. So there we started abatacept, few doses because it takes time to work. And progressively, very progressively, we were able to get a troponin decrease and we were able to win prednisone and get the patient better, but it took a lot of time. So why abatacept? Because I, as I told you, if you remember well before, you need for the T cell to be active, it needs the second signal. And the second signal would be activated by CD28 binding with CD80, CD86 here. And the job of CTLA4 is to avoid that. So if you give a CTLA4 fusion protein, a batacept or a galatacept here, you're going to impede this activation and you will reverse specifically the, pace, the pathways activated by ICIs, and you will tone down the immune system. But the problem is that it takes a while. It's not an immediate effect. It's not acting in an hour or two. It takes days when you give massive amount of do massive doses, and eventually a month in its approved indication in rheumatoid arthritis, the full effect is one month after starting the drug because it's low dose and they're not in a hurry in rheumatoid arthritis. So this mice model was very helpful to us for, this, for the studies I'm going to show you afterwards. So this mice model, a CTLA4 plus minus PD1 minus minus, here you can see these mice die, 50% of them die within 100 days as compared to their controls. Here are the black lines. And they die of what? of microdiabetes. Again, here, it's a funny story. I remember well, James Allison was coming and giving a talk at Vanderbilt and he met Javid and he was telling him, you know what? I developed this model to see which cancer will answer or not, but they're dying. I'm not able to, to put, to insert the cancer in them. And at the end, Javid told him, you should look at the heart. And basically it was, they were all dying of microdiabetes. So here again, I think Javid showed you that this mice model is really interesting. A bunch of T cells and macrophages killing the mice. I'm going just to, to remind you this one. When you do give a batacept, it reverses the mortality. It's a green line. The problem is that to get rid of the cardiac immune infiltration, as you can see here, it takes weeks. So two weeks after starting a batacept, cardiac immune infiltration is similar. It takes 14 weeks to get rid of the infiltration. So if I give you our updated, unpublished yet, but uh, submitted, of course, experience on 40 consecutive cases. So here it's like, a, it's a year or a year and a half ago, we finished up this. So at this point, time point, 69 cases suspected, 40 confirmed, we graded them, asymptomatic, post-symptomatic, symptomatic in life-threatening. 
And the first 10 patients, unfortunately, were not good, like uh, described, 60% of mortality. Eight of them, basically, they all received the boluses of uh, corticosteroids. Eight escaped, were corticoresistant and severe, received plasmapheresis in the hope to getting rid of the ICI, didn't work, and then eventually received some abatacept. Are you trying a position in your conference? Sorry, I did not hear. Can you repeat, please? I don't think that was a question. I think someone just didn't mute themselves. Sorry about that. Uh, sorry. So, uh, yes. So, we the first uh, patient, basically, when we started this strategy, they started to die less from the heart. So, less arrhythmias, less heart failure, but they start dying of something else, which was a very weird hypercapnic respiratory muscle failure with normal EF, normalized EF, and no arrhythmias. And so we went on an autopsy and we, have, we discovered basically that all of those patients died from concomitant myositis affecting respiratory muscle. So when you have a diaphragm like this, full of these dots and no more like completely obliterated and not working, you cannot breathe and you die. And then all those, this patient on the 10 patient, nine on 10 had a myositis and pathology except for one I told you before, it was the HIV patient, very special. So from there, we learned that it's not just myocarditis, it's also a whole mitoxicity with all the muscles. And if we want to get rid of, I mean, make them survive, we just don't have to keep in mind just the heart, but the whole, the whole story is with all, the, with all the muscles. And what we learn again is that plasmapheresis was kind of useless because here is plasmapheresis, here is plasmapheresis. You get rid of ICI blood concentration, okay? But to restore PD-1 cell fraction and restore PD-1 expression on T cells, it takes four to six months, even with plasmapheresis. Why? Because the concentration you're seeing here that is up and down, so you take out there is a release in the blood, you take out, there is a release in the blood again. So these levels of concentration are over 100 times over what is needed to block 100% of the PT1. So basically you have to be way below the limit of detection, which is one here, to eventually be at levels that are going to make PD1 expression again uh, possible. So the release, when you give PD-1, it's stopped basically in the system, in vascular cells and in a lot of different organs. So even if you get rid of some of it in the blood, there will be a release from the peripheral, from the other organs, and just enough to kick in the system and to knock it out for, a month, for months. So if you want to reverse something acute, it's not going to happen. So we have done this on 10 patients. So we systematically have shown that on the 10 first patients. So we stopped completely doing it basically afterwards. Second, I told you that abatacept takes a while to act. And the dose we're giving it, at least in rheumatoid arthritis, are very low because we're not in a hurry to get our effect. A way to be able to monitor that is CD86 receptor occupancy. So the way you work with this is you take your monocyte in the blood, you check for his receptor occupancy before giving ABBA. You give ABBA and you see how much is left. And with this, you calculate your receptor occupancy. And to have a full effect, you need that your receptor occupancy is below 80%. So uh, because it was not enough in our first 10 patients, we decided to optimize our ABBA recept loading dose. And when we installed CD86 receptor occupancy uh, real time, so basically in this patient, for example, you have this same patient, thymoma patient, one dose exploded his EF from 60% to 0%. Here is on ECMO. Here I'm cold. Uh, he, all, of course, received also his one gram, one gram, one gram prompt, promptly initially. And when it, they went down, boom, the patient exploded. So again, one of these patients having a one gram within 24 hours of admission and not 
being with no maze. So EF drop, ECMO, we start ABA, 20 milligram per kilo, which is basically twice the 10 milligram per kilo starting dose that is used in general. And we're not reaching, reaching 80%. We redose three days later, or most ABA has been consumed. We reshoot ABA 20 milligram per kilo. Again, not reaching 80% of receptor occupancy, but the EF is better and the troponin is trending down. We're here seven days after the first dose, he's recurring, despite having an EF being better, he's recurring VTs. We re-dose CD86 negative. He consumes the whole abatacept and CD receptor, 86 receptor occupancy is completely out. It's basically what we observe when we go down on, on corticosteroids, CD86 is re-expressed. So there is a flare-up effect with CD86 being re-expressed and not enough with the ABBA we gave previously. That's why I'm not using anymore at all this one gram sink and just low dose corticosteroids to avoid those, those CD86 uh, very big uh, differences. So again, we gave him 20 milligram per kilo that you observe here and again up and we reached our 80% receptor occupancy. So basically within, within a week, we gave him 60 milligram per kilo of abatacept while the dose given in rheumatoid arthritis is 10 milligram per kilo every two weeks. So we gave six times the dose required for rheumatoid arthritis to try to get this receptor occupancy uh, target. And second, even if you do that, it's not acting in a few hours and the guy is basically on ECMO, so you don't have a lot of time. So we also hypothesized that there is another way, another combination to be added to abatacept because ABA is basically an antibody and will act longer term that JAK inhibitors, for example, acting promptly, but, but for very few time, few hours. So why ruxolitinib? You understood that macrophages is key and lymphocyte is key. ABA is just doing the trick here between both, but JAK inhibitors are key to deactivate T cells through a bunch of mechanisms mediated by cytokines. And also, it's also decreasing CD86 expression. So by giving ruxolitinib in addition to abatacept, you're able, and in addition to corticosteroids, you're able to inactivate very promptly the immune system. So this is what we gave to this, this ECMO patient, thymoma patient. Rux, as soon as we were called, ABA very high dose, monitored on CD86 receptor occupancy, and ruxolitinib in addition to decreasing quickly the corticosteroids. So basically, we have done this mix in the next 30 patients, giving ABA monitored on CD86, monitoring real time, adding ruxolitinib, dropping steroids doses, stopping those, uh, those IV doses, and basically starting 0 0.5, one milligram per kilo max. And this is what we observe in terms of ICI myotoxicity related mortality and in terms of overall mortality. So we also, as I told you, stopped plasma pheresis because it was basically not really useful in terms of uh, acting promptly. And more importantly, we screened all our patient and ventilated all the one who needed it. So instead of waiting for the guy being hypercapnic with 60 and uh, dying in his bed and then thinking about invasive ventilation, we screen them actively for respiratory muscle involvement and checked for them if they needed CPAP or some kind of ventilation that we trained them for to have it. And just during the night, for example, for it to be much easier to be manageable and to avoid concomitant infection if the patient is completely intubated. So by managing and screening for respiratory muscle failure, starting promptly the doses of ABA monitored and ruxolitinib, decreasing the steroid doses to avoid all the side effects, infection and stuff, we were able to observe this in our cohort. Of course, it's not a prospective trial, but this is our result. And lastly, the grade one patients, the one just with biomarker plus and confirmed on biopsy and with low level of troponins, no hypercapnia, no other symptoms, just no symptoms. We just observed them with 
withholding ICI and no treatment at all. In this category now, we have over 20 and they don't have any trouble. If you diagnose them promptly, you stop ICI, you observe them, you can manage it. You have just to have some threshold for acting. And this is another work we're doing right now. We'll publish it somehow soon. So this is for your record, how it goes for the 22 patient treated with ABA. So when was the first injection, injection two in terms of delay and timing and how it evolved in CD86 receptor occupancy, how it goes down after dosing, it goes up after dosing again, go down between doses, goes up after doses anyway. And the more you give, the more you have a CD86 receptor uh, occupancy uh, increase. And lastly, this slide is basically a courtesy from Javid's mice. When you look at Jack's pathway, in mice with myocarditis and control, you can see that JAK2, which is a target of oxalitinib, is popping up, as well as all the STAT pathway beneath it. So JAK STAT is activated, but more specifically JAK2. And if you look at humans, again, only JAK2 is popping up, and basically it is a target of oxalitinib. In terms of cancer outcome, uh, when you die from a myotoxicity, you die promptly, as you can see here. In our cohort, in the 33 not dead from myotoxicity, basically over 70%, 75% survived at six months. And PFS, progression-free survival, is around 50% at six months. And 80% had stable or partial anti-cancer response. So uh, we have to keep in mind, of course, that we're treating cancer patients. At the end of the day, we do want to have the cancer to respond properly, and we just don't want to just treat over treat the myocarditis. And for this, we really need to to move forward and do customized trial to basically see what is the mix, the minimal mix, immunosuppressant mix required to tone down enough the ICI myocarditis, avoiding a huge flare-up of the tumor. So this is a it's a real game at the end of the day. And I would really like to thank um, all the contributors and of whom some of you at UCSF, of course, Mandar Hara, Salan Bayak, for example, uh, for this international red cap that we have put together with over 750 cases now. And we, we have like several very nice stories upcoming. I've not shown them yet, obviously, because I cannot, they're not published and so on, but we have very, very nice uh, stories upcoming soon with this. And that's it. Thanks so much, Dr. Selen. That was a great talk. Uh, we have time for a few questions. So if anyone in the audience has a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Uh, great job, Joely. Um, one quick question that I had was uh, for patients who have had previous cardiac injury, whether that's an MI or things along those lines as well too, are they more predisposed to ICI myocarditis? The reason I say that is like, you can potentially have prime T cells already that are just waiting to be reactivated. So curious if you've seen that borne out in the data. It's not obvious today. It's more, uh, we cannot say that. What we can, what I can say about that, it's of course, someone who have a cardiovascular condition prior would likely have a troponin increase at some point in his follow-up. And will likely we be, would be a suspicion at some point for someone to be an ICI myocarditis. So of course, maybe you have this kind of bias because the patient has a prior history and to sort out what is a myocarditis from a previous heart failure, unknown heart failure or a previous unknown myocarditis can be hard, but I don't, I don't think that we have been seeing the fulminant form in those guys, at least not in my experience, nor in the analysis we have performed so far. Joely, then my name is Connor O'Brien. I've had a few cases uh, with Javid, so he's shared a lot of your guys' experience with it. It's really fascinating work. Um, I want to ask two quick questions. So we do all critical care on our side, and we the patients we've had. One of the questions I've always wondered is one or two fold uh, is mostly around infections. Uh, have you do you have any data around infections um, with patients who are on MCS? and ventilated? And then also uh, other questions, what is your average time when you have patients on MCS? I'm sure the number is small, but to get them off 
mechanical support like what you sort of expect so this is this is exactly why i have stopped completely giving those high dose corticosteroids because in those cases it doesn't work at all and basically when you go down to one milligram per kilo so cd86 will explode plus when you give this one gram forever you have all those very very nasty infections uh, so one key basically to avoid the infection is to avoid giving very, very high dose steroids that is that are not effective and are harmful. So in the first six patients, in the first 10 patients, two of them died with also a concomitant sepsis, so a, a, sh a septic shock. And, and afterwards, when we stopped giving this very, very high dose corticosteroids, we did not observe anymore those very, very nasty infection. And the infection we observed were pretty easy to manage on antibiotics or sometimes antiviral. You may have reactivation of some viruses, but it's not like critically, um, it's not critical in the first few days to treat them, those ones. Plus when we stopped intubating them basically, because we were screening very, very actively for ventilation, for a respiratory muscle failure, we were able to give them CPAP and some stuff that were not that invasive to avoid those kind of infections. So part of it is to try to avoid intubation by training the patient and giving them CPAP a few hours a day. Uh, I mean, sometimes it can go up to 12 hours, but it's better than being intubated all the time. And lastly, when you, you, you have this patient on ECMO, it really depends on how quick you get them. So if you, they're starting to be on ECMO and you're not wandering around for, a, I don't know, 10 days, you don't know where you're going. If they're just being starting the heart failure and you start promptly have a very high dose, rexolitinib and um, 0 0.5 or one milligram per kilo of steroids, if you, you're starting the treatment yourself, in five days, you should they, they should be gone of, with ECMO, you're, you're good to go. And same thing for um, AV blocks, permanent AV, blo AV blocks, high grades, it's a few days. But when you wait forever, like 10 days or two weeks to give the appropriate treatment, then it can be very long. It can still work, but it's going to be very long because the lesions are there, the destruction are there. So it will take a lot of time to reverse. To be honest, it's not the heart failure or the arrhythmias that are really long to take time. The longest thing is respiratory muscle failure. This can take forever. So it can take three weeks, two months of ventilation, non-invasive ventilation, to, to, to get the respiratory muscle refunction again. So basically, they're going to be winnable, but very progressively. So you start... Uh, they start with, I don't know, intubated, let's say, and then you can have them off intubation like 12 hours a day on non-invasive ventilation. And then you go down to eight hours, six hours during the night only. And after two months, uh, you get rid of it. And the longest one, basically, we had a patient that was intubated for two months, just having mostly a peripheral muscle lesions. So diaphragm and respiratory muscle off, but the heart being kind of okay intubated for two months in another intensive care unit. So we, 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 we started the treatment, but it took like six months, six months to be able to get him out from uh, ventilation because it, it, it took a lot of time and steps to be able to reverse the respiratory muscle failure. So the longest to wait before starting the good treatment, the longest it will take to reverse and uh, this is the thing I can tell you. But if you go promptly, you're the first hand, you're the first one to take it. The patient is severe and you start this triplet of treatment very promptly. Five, six days, you can be out of all the, at least the cardiac failure stuff. Excellent. And then one other quick question. Uh, did you have any thrombotic complications with any of your patients on mechanical support? But active so cancer? initially, again, so this was basically in the initial patient, we had 40% of patients that had a concomitant thrombolic um, issue. So, but, but again, it was because patients were there forever in beds, not being treated on corticosteroids for a week or two, looking around them, not really like wandering around. Uh, now that we, if we look at the, 
So I can't even show you that in supplementary data of these papers that we submitted. So now when we go promptly straight to the point, we almost have no, not any more those kind of issue. The only issue we can have is ruxolitinib is, is decreasing platelet big time and leading to anemia. So we have to be extremely careful to, to anemia and transfusion need because we lost one patient on hemorrhagic shock. Uh, because of like he was having one gram steroids, having his ulceration of the gastric ulceration, plus ruxolitinib, uh, he was not able to regenerate his hemoglobin because uh, it's leading to a high regenerative uh, anemia. It's blocking basically the platelet uh, production and hemoglobin production. So when you go for this, you have to be very careful to hemoglobin. So our threshold to transfuse those patients, those severe patients is very low. So below nine, I'm just transfusing them because of this, just like gives them one or two. and Because I, I just know that they don't have any reserve in terms of reproducing hemoglobin while they are on ruxolitinib. Median time of ruxolitinib is two to three weeks. Abatacept median dose is three to five. But in very severe cases, like the guy who, who stayed two months as just intubated and waiting forever, he ha had 10, for example. So we have to adjust. Hi, uh, and this is YC. So I have a quick question about the, like, a, so there are a lot of uh, patients may also uh, take the ICI may also combine with the target therapy like uh, uh, VGF inhibitor. Uh, in your experience, how about uh, the treatment or the instance of the myocarditis uh, when patients also combine with other target therapy and is it will become more severe? It's not obvious today to say that. What I what, what I can say, on the other hand, is like diagnosis of differential is more complex in this situation, because uh, I remember very well of a patient being on MEK inhibitor, having uh, I'm called he's on MEK inhibitor in a protocol MEK inhibitor plus ICI. We have this guy with an EF of thirty percent prior; it was sixty percent, and he has been on ICI for two doses and MEK inhibitor a month or something like that. But this patient is having no arrhythmia, ECG is not that bad. And uh, at the end of the day, he has a troponin T of 30 or 40. And the upper threshold is 14. So he's only two to three times upper limit. So in this guy, I'm like, I've never seen any of the patients with an EF appearance of an EF of 30% with not a troponin at least at least three time above the upper limit. So here I was like, with a three time upper limit increase, as no CK increase concomitant, no peripheral muscle symptoms, no diplopia, no myasthenia, no nothing. I don't think it's ICI. I think it's a MEK inhibitor because if it was an ICI fulminant microditis, you would not be talking to me and telling me it's been three days, we're wandering around. This guy would be gone since a long time. Troponin is too low. So here you have some complexity. You will have more complexity because to sort out if it's a heart failure or a cardiac dysfunction associated to one of the drugs, but not really a microditis, same thing for antiangiogenic or a troponin, troponin increase just due to some associated drugs and not really an ICI microdose, it's going to be hard. So here we, we do need to work to better identify the cases, the real cases of mitoxicity versus some cardiac something with other. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Salem, again, for being able to chat with us. I think everyone's coming away from this talk with a better sense of the management of this entity of immune checkpoint related myocarditis. So again, thank you so much. See you. Take care, everyone.